the most famous of the failed Mongol naval expeditions of the 13th century, it was not the only one. In the early 1290s, Mongol ruler and emperor of the Yuan dynasty Kublai Khan ordered a fleet to sail from southern China to Java in modern Indonesia, a campaign which resulted in a humiliating retreat. The expedition against Java was one of the last military campaigns ordered by Kublai in his long life, and like many of these later invasions, cost the Yuan heavily in men and resources for little gain. In this part of our series on how to defend against the Mongols, we look at how the inhabitants of Java were able to prevent their islands from becoming part of the Mongol Empire, with little damage to their own people. This video was sponsored by our kind YouTube members and patrons. Becoming a YouTube member or patron is the best way to support our work, so we're now providing our supporters with exclusive videos to thank them. Join their ranks to watch the Pacific War series, alongside the First Punic War, Sulla's biography, the Italian War of Unification, Risorgimento, the Russo-Japanese War, Albigensian Crusade, History of Prussia, and much more. 80 or so exclusive videos in total. In 2024, YouTube members and patrons will watch series on the Fall of Sparta, the Reconquista, Second Punic War, Spanish War of Succession, and Russian Civil War, and will continue getting early access to all videos, access to an exclusive Discord server, will know our schedule, and vote on future videos. YouTube member and patron support allows us to keep the majority of our videos free in a world where YouTube monetization income is very uneven. If you want to support our work, join their ranks today via the link in the description and pinned comment. Thank you! In the 13th century, eastern Java and parts of the neighboring islands of Sumatra and Borneo came under the influence of the Kingdom of Tumapel, named for the city of the same name on the island of Java. It was also known as the Kingdom of Singhasari, thanks to its king Jaya Wisnuhadhana, who changed it to be called this. The Tumapel kings were not absolute rulers, as much of their kingdom was made up of loosely controlled vassal kings and chiefs but they controlled a lucrative position along the maritime trade routes through Indonesia and across the southern coastline of the Eurasian landmass. By the 12th century, Java was a leading exporter of goods from India to China, especially rice, pepper and safflower dye, while in turn importing gold, silver, lacquerware, iron goods and ceramics from China. The Southeast Asian sea trade was a valuable market which had been expanding considerably since the 9th century and one which attracted the attention of a man hungry for world conquest. By the 1280s, the Mongol great Khan Kublai had successfully conquered China, but other victories were frustratingly eluding him in Central Asia, Japan, Vietnam and Burma. As he advanced in years, the knowledge that he was failing to bring the rest of the world under Mongol authority weighed heavily on him. Now in his 70s, with his poor health, depression, deaths of his friends and family, increasing removal from affairs of state, and awareness of his own impending mortality, Kublai became desperate for victories to console his aching spirit. Economic aspects too were not to be overlooked, and were simply a factor in the inevitable universal domination. Kublai's Yuan dynasty, while influenced by China's Confucian norms and traditions, maintained the Mongolian practicality regarding merchants. Rather than treat them as an inherently lower class, they were invited and rewarded and trade encouraged. The Yuan government partook in this with the conquest of the southern Chinese coastline, establishing a Bureau of Maritime Trade at the major port of Chuanzhou. The Bureau not only oversaw and taxed the trade in and out of Chuanzhou, but sought to actively encourage it, while settling foreign traders there. Contacts were made across the region, from the Southeast Asian coast through the Philippines, Indonesia, including Java and Sumatra, to India and the Iranian coastline. There is evidence for South Indian-style Hindu temples with Tamil transcriptions in Chuanzhou from this period, a significant Muslim population and resettled Persians who called the city Zaitan, by which Marco Polo recorded the name. Speaking of Polo, there is also evidence for an Italian trading community in Chuanzhou. It was an entry point for the world. It was the port that Ibn Battuta, during his journeys in the 1340s, arrived at. The Yuan dynasty had a keen interest in trade and sought to extend their control over it throughout the region, at the same time extending the Mongols' heavenly mandate to rule the whole of the world. 
With these considerations, Kublai Khan increased diplomatic missions across the seas of southern Asia, from Malabar to Sri Lanka, ordering the monarchs and peoples across the sea to submit to the Great Khan. As it was an old tradition to send a yearly tribute for the privilege of trading with China, most regional states already undertook a nominal submission in order to have greater access to Chinese ports. While traditional Chinese dynasties were generally content to accept the trade and maintain the image of themselves as the center of the world, even if they did not exercise actual authority in these states, the Mongols were often not quite as lenient. To be a vassal to the great Khan meant the potential of making all resources and people available to the Khan's desires, measured through census and Mongol-appointed overseers. When Kublai sent his diplomatic missions over the seas, they often were sent not just to reaffirm or increase the tribute, but to increase the extent to which these overseas monarchs needed to comply with the will of the House of Chinggis Khan. On one such mission, an envoy named Meng Chi arrived in the court of Katanagara, the king of Tumapel, sometime in the 1280s. Katanagara had been the king since the 1260s and had shown himself a haughty individual and firm adherent to Tantric Buddhism. Since his ascension, he had expanded his kingdom over eastern Sumatra and most of Java. By all accounts, Katanagana was quite keen to solidify his control of trade and spice routes, but much less keen on sharing it with the distant Khan. In the various sources, after feeling offended by the envoy Meng Chi and his demands, Katanagara either insulted him, branded his face with a hot iron, cut off his nose, or outright killed him. In either case, he had committed a grievous insult on an envoy of the Great Khan, which, as you may have heard, was not something taken lightly. Katanagara's calculation was likely a simple one. He did not want to increase the share of tribute sent to China for the privilege of trading, but still wanted that Chinese trade. It was a reasonable assumption that the island of Java was well outside the range of an actual attack from China, leaving him physically secure from any repercussions. Once tensions had cooled, Katanagara could hypothetically send an apology mission and resume trade. These were reasonable assumptions, but Kublai Khan was not feeling reasonable. By the later 1280s, the deaths of Kublai's closest confidant, his wife Chabi, chosen heir Jingim, and his most important advisors, as well as alcoholism and depression, had clouded his judgment. Kublai's earliest campaigns against the Dali Kingdom and Song Dynasty were marked by thorough preparation and intelligence gathering, taking advantage of weaknesses within the enemy to bring the final victory. Decades later, isolated and depressed, surrounded by yes-men who lacked the ability to stand up to him and desperate for victory, Kublai had come to rely on throwing manpower at a problem, hoping tactical success would lead automatically to strategic victories. Kublai's knowledge of Java was minimal, but he did not care. The ruler of some island in the sea had no right to insult the master of the world. Thus, Kublai ordered an attack upon the kingdom of Tumapel to bring Katanagara to heel. At least this is the understanding from the Chinese language sources of the Yuan and Ming dynasties. In the medieval Javanese and Balinese sources, the incident with Meng Chi the envoy is unmentioned. Instead, Kublai was a friend of the minister, Madura Wiraraja, who requested Kublai provide military assistance to the royal family of Tumapel. In this version, Katanagara was usurped by a man named Jayakatwang, and Kublai's forces quite respectfully came, defeated the usurper, placed the rightful heir, Katanagara's son-in-law, Radin Vijaya, on the throne, and took in exchange only a beautiful princess for Kublai to marry. Generally speaking, most reconstructions rely on the Chinese account, though the Javanese sources are interesting for how they justify and depict the Yuan presence. Regardless, an invasion fleet and army were prepared in 1292. 20,000 men, mainly from southern China, were mobilized aboard 1,000 vessels. This army was led by the former Song commander Gao Xing, the navy by a Uyghur named Yikmis, and all were under the overall command of a Mongol named Shibi. The commanders prepared carefully, having learned from the disastrous naval assaults on Japan and Daiviet. They had on board a year's supply of grain and 40,000 ounces of silver to purchase more supplies. 
the commanders met with Kublai himself before their departure. The Khan of Khans told Shibi to leave naval matters to Yikmi's expertise, and that they must proclaim on their arrival that they were not an invasion force, but merely there to punish Katanagara for harming a Yuan envoy. If true, it may reflect an understanding that facing battle in unknown lands, against a foe they did not know, was not ideal. The strategy, it seems, was merely to overawe the Javanese. The mere threat of their presence anticipated to be enough to earn a victory. The fleet set out in the winter of 1292-93, making a short stopover in Champa, now paying tribute and at peace with the Mongols. There, officers were dispatched on diplomatic missions to Lamuri, Samudra, Perlak and Malayu in Sumatra, seeking tribute and submission. By March 1293, the fleet was off the coast of Java and preparing to make landfall. It was decided to send a diplomatic force ahead of the main fleet to convince Kotanagara to submit and avoid having to make landfall at all. If there was no progress on the diplomatic front in a week, then the fleet was to follow up as a show of force. The diplomatic mission found no success, for matters had changed considerably in Java by the time of their arrival. The haughty king of Tumapel, Katanagara, was dead, slain by his vassal Jayakatong of Gilang, based in the city of Kadiri. Katanagara's son-in-law, Radan Vijaya, based in Majapahit, was resisting him, and the Yuan arrived in the midst of a civil war. A week after the envoys were sent, the Amada landed at Taban, where part of the army under Gaoxing and Yikmis disembarked and marched to Pachacan. The rest of the army was to follow aboard the ships under the command of Tukadege, sailing through the Straits of Madura to rendezvous with the land force. At Pachacan, Jayakatong's navy blocked the Brantes River, but made no move against the Yuan. The Yuan commanders landed and set up a banquet, inviting the Javanese to come over and discuss terms. No response was made by the Javanese, and after a while, the Yuan fleet and army advanced. Jayakatong's navy retreated before them, and after garrisoning Pachacan, the Yuan forces made their way inland along the Brantes. As they moved inland, they were greeted by envoys of Raden Vijaya, begging Yuan help. The young prince only had a small force, and Jayakatong of Gilang's army was on its way to attack Vijaya's base at Majapahit. In exchange, Vijaya would submit to the Great Khan. Seeing supporting Vijaya as the key to gaining the submission of Java, Yikmis ordered Gao Xing to take a part of the army and intercept Jayakatong, while Yikmis took the rest of the force to reinforce Majapahit. Jayakatong managed to evade Gao Xing and reached Majapahit, only to find Yikmis had already assembled his forces to meet Jayakatong's tired troops. After a night of standoff, the next day, Gao Xing arrived with the rest of the Yuan troops, and all together they drove off Jayakatong's army. Radan Vijaya once again promised his total submission to the Great Khan if the Yuan forces helped him defeat Jayakatong for good. And after providing them maps, a week later they set off for Jayakatong's capital at Kadiri. The Yuan moved in three columns the fleet on the Brantus River under Chukadege, with Gao Xing and Yikmis taking their forces up either bank, while behind them travelled a large force from Majapahit under Radan Vijaya. The army made good time and reached Kadiri within a few days, finding Jayakatong prepared with a large force. The next day, until the morning from early afternoon, Jayakatong's force advanced three times, and three times they were repulsed with heavy losses by the arms of the Yuan dynasty and Majapahit. By the end of the day, Jayakatong's army broke, fleeing across the river or into Kadiri with Jayakatong. An assault on the city followed, and by nightfall, Jayakatong surrendered. For the next week, the Yuan were the masters of Java. Raden Vijaya's promised submission now had come. For this, he desired to return to Majapahit with a small unarmed Yuan escort to properly witness his formal submission. While that force departed for Majapahit, Shibi sent most of the army back to Pachacan while he stayed in Kadiri with a small force, thinking he had handily conquered Java for the Khan. Once Raden Vijaya saw that the Yuan troops had let their guard down, at the end of the day he killed the Yuan escorts who followed him back to Majapahit rallied his armies and urged the people of Java to repel the foreign invaders. Only narrowly did Shibi escape the trap for him at Kadiri. He fought his way back to Pachacan, 
losing up to 3,000 men. Back aboard the ships, the commanders argued over whether to counterattack or to retreat, ultimately choosing the latter. Not knowing the country, outnumbered and unlikely to find local support, they understood further combat would likely only have one disastrous outcome. With that, she be ordered a withdrawal back to home port. While they did bring back some trophies, maps of Java, population registers, spices, gold, silver, rhino horn and prisoners, this did not offset the costs of the campaign. Not as disastrous as the invasions of Japan or Vietnam, even this tactically well-executed campaign could not be turned into a strategic victory and resulted in a humiliating retreat. Kublai was furious, punishing the commanders, stripping them of a third of their property and rewarding them with 50 blows from the rod. Once Kublai Khan died in early 1294, there was no stomach to avenge that defeat or those others suffered in Southeast Asia. By contrast, Raden Vijaya established a powerful empire based in Majapahit that came to rule most of modern Indonesia and Malaysia, founded in part with Mongol assistance. By the end of the 1290s, after Kublai's death, Vijaya sent missions to the Yuan dynasty to resume valuable trade contacts. Despite their reputation for destruction across much of Eurasia, in the Javanese chronicle there is but a single reference to the Mongols destroying towns and sending people running in flight, reflective of the hope for a less destructive campaign, perhaps helping with the memory of the invasion becoming that of Kublai coming to assist his friends in exchange for a beautiful princess. It was a rather different view than their forces earned in many other places. In the end, Java successfully defended against the Mongols with perhaps the most minimal amount of destruction to their own lands. Through guile, they took advantage of a well-prepared but hesitant Yuan army, and they were thereby able to not only use Mongol troops to their advantage, but inflict upon them a defeat with relatively little bloodshed. In many ways, it was the most effective, least cost-intensive, and most beneficial resistance put up by any of the states we have looked at over this series. Our series on how various peoples defended against the Mongols will continue in the near future, so make sure you have subscribed and pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.